Our program tonight is going to be moderated by Dr. Sasha Helper. Sasha is a child psychiatrist with a private practice in the Boston area, and she is herself a writer. Her columns appear regularly in Psychiatric Times. And after our speaker's formal remarks, she will open the dialogue with some questions for them. After those initial questions, the discussion will be open to include all the members of the audience. Thank you again for coming tonight. And now here is our moderator to introduce the program and our speakers. Um, artistic creativity has linked in, been linked in popular imagination with suffering, illness, untimely death. Does this romantic image correspond to the reality of producing a work of art, a poem, a play, a song? Tonight, we're fortunate enough to have two noted artists who have each effectively captured events, experiences, and emotions in multiple genres, and who will help illuminate the relationship between one's emotional life and one's creative life. Paul Muldoon is the Howard G.B. Clark Professor at Princeton University. He's Chair of Princeton Peter B. Lewis Center for the Arts. He's Poetry Editor of The New Yorker. His collections of poetry include Poems 1968 to 1998, Moist Sand and Gravel, for which he won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize, and his 10th collection of poems is Horse Latitude, which appeared in the fall of 2006. He's received numerous literary awards and been described by the Times Literary Supplement as, quote, the most significant English language poet born since the Second World War. In my family, Paul Muldoon's name does not come up when Robert Frost comes up, where Longfellow comes up, where Donald Hall comes up. When Mick Jagger is mentioned, Paul Muldoon comes up because Paul Muldoon has a rock band named Racket. And perhaps during the conversation, that will be talked about as well. So um, Paul, if you'd like to start. Thank you very much. Oh, wait, I guess I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I should introduce Elizabeth, too, um, before she starts, too. Elizabeth Suedos <laughs> is best known for Broadway and international smash hit Runaways. She's composed and written and directed for over 30 years. Her works include the Obie Award-winning trilogy at La Mama, Alice at the Palace with Meryl Streep, at the New York Shakespeare Theater, Groundhog, a variety of biblical musical adaptations as well. She has published novels, nonfiction books, children's books and poetry to great acclaim, and has received the Ken Award for her book on her depressive episode called My Depression. Her theater textbook, At Play, Teaching Te Teenagers Theater, was published in 2006. A new book of poetry has come out, The One and Only Human Galaxy. Her awards include five Tony nominations, three Obie Awards, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Ford Grant, a Helen Hayes Award, a Lila Acheson Wallace Grant, and a Penn Citation. Liz has been creating issue-oriented theater for young people her entire career. So welcome to the Cambridge Forum, Paul Muldoon and Liz Suedos. So, Paul. Thank you very there. much indeed. I'd just like to begin by saying that I think I much prefer Liz Suedos' uh, list of achievements <laughs> to my own. <laughs> and, and I suppose in a strange way, you know, the topic tonight is... Um, the artistic life and the extent to which the word mood might be appropriate to it. It's one of those words, of course, that I, uh, as I usually do when I'm faced by a word that I, that I uh, don't understand or think perhaps I do understand but almost certainly don't, I do go running off to the great Oxford English Dictionary to have a little trawl around as to what the word might mean. And in fact, uh, yet again, I was astonished to discover that it's a word that's been with us for a rather long time. And in fact, it's a word that's used in Beowulf, 
And if we count Beowulf as the first uh, great English poem, I know there are those who count it as something else. But let's take for the purpose of argument that it is an English poem rather than a German poem or whatever it might be. The word, what's interesting already in Beowulf is that the word has already two meanings. It has already two meanings. There's a nuance involved with it. And let me just check what they are here. I mean, at its root, it refers to some notion of the mournful. Uh, a frame of mind, that's one usage in Beowulf. Uh, he had a mournful frame of mind. What the OED would refer to as a state of feelings, one's humor, temper, or disposition at a particular time. Um, the other sense, the other sense in which it's used in Beowulf is that of courage. And that courage is related to the notion of anger or rage. And, it stri and that, of course, is a, uh, is, is, a, is a sense of the word mood that uh, I suppose we have in, in the word moody to some extent. Uh, certainly in Shakespeare, in uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona, who in my mood I stabbed unto the heart, the sense that it was a, a, something of a fit or a rage in which this violent activity took place. And I suppose one of the things I'm and so far as I understand anything about this, which of course is imperfectly, which is one of the reasons why we're here this evening, is perhaps to try to figure out a few of these aspects of, of what might be connected uh, between these, uh, connecting these two ideas. Uh, I suppose I'm fascinated by the notion that indeed uh, there is a connection between the, the fit the rage, certainly some sense of being beyond oneself, ecstatic, of indeed being beyond time in some sense, and, and then the mood in the sense that Wordsworth would have used it when, just to get my quote right, uh, for oft, when I on when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And uh, Wordsworth is using the term there, I suppose, in the sense of the uh, almost a condition in which inspiration might come flooding or flowing in. And uh, I want to think for a moment, if I may, about a connection uh, between Wordsworth and uh, Robert Frost, or to move from Wordsworth to Robert Frost, because Frost picks up on that notion. Uh, he writes in uh, a piece called Before the Beginning and After the End of a Poem, a little-known talk he gave in uh, Coral Gables in Florida, I think sometime in the 1930s. He writes as follows, and I want you to consider this as a description of an out-of-the-body experience, as it were. The subject should emerge as the poem is written. One should not know what to name a poem until he, and I'm sure he means she, is at least two-thirds through it. The person who knows the name, now it's interesting he doesn't say the, the title of the poem, the name of his poem, or the end of his poem before he writes it, ought not to write it. <laughs> In other words, one is giving oneself over into a state of ecstasy. And yet the thing should emerge as if it had all the enthusiasm of the name i.e. that there's a sense that it's uh, predestined, preordained, and the objects being foreknown. When does a person know what he means by a poem? When he draws near the end. And he writes in his great piece, uh, his essay, The Figure a Poem Makes, it has an an outcome that, though unforeseen, was predestined from the first image of the original mood. And in 
indeed from the very mood, which is a very particular sense of the word mood, it seems to me, and uncommon enough, though related to the words worthy and sense, use of, of, uh, of that word. Now, I want to suggest to you, in the, the way that I, I'm sometimes uh, given to suggesting, that there's a particular charge to Frost's use of this word, which might bring us back to uh, the sense of the mood as a rage. In that, um, his mother's name was Isabel Moody. <laughs> And I want to suggest to you that Frost is not idly using, he may be actually unconsciously, but at some level, consciously or unconsciously, not idly uh, using the name, uh, the word mood. And that he's connecting it in some sense profoundly with making sense of himself and with his uh, relationship uh, to his mother and his mother to himself. He associates himself, by the way, with a character you may recall called the Moody Forester, um, the first poem in a witness tree written by a version of Frost known as the Moody Forester. Actually, the little frost in forest there too. Once down on my knees to growing plants, I prodded the earth with a lazy tool in time with a medley of sotto chants that becoming aware of some boys from school who had stopped outside the fence to spy, I stopped my song and almost heart, for any eye is an evil eye that looks in on a mood apart. It seems to me that it's almost as if uh, there's a description here of a primal scene. Uh, in which a tool which is prod in the earth is stopped, some boys from school intrude, and the boys who look in are not welcomed, uh, as they often seem to be welcomed into other Frost poems, You Come To. Um, in any case, I, uh, I want to suggest to you that what Frost is describing in this notion of the mood, uh, as I say, has to do primarily with the condition of being somewhat out, outside of time uh, that is associated with the making of art. We recognize it as readers when we read a novel and we discover that an afternoon has gone by and we're not entirely certain of where it's gone. And exactly the same um, experience has befallen the writer, the artist, the playwright, the poet. There has been an absolute uh, shutting down of a sense of time in any conventional any conventional manner while that poem was written. And one of the reasons it seems to me that those poems are written in many cases at all has to do with the fact that the poet is engaged in a form of mood enhancement as that poem is being written. And it may have to do with coming to terms with the matter of the poem, with the matter of her or his life, but there is a particular chemical uh, charge, I think, to the experience uh, that many, most writers, I think, uh, have as they're at work uh, with a, a rush of endorphins or whatever it might be, that I think is the equivalent of a, a drug to which the, the writer returns. And in making sense of her or his life may actually have some respite uh, some moment of being equal to the difficulty uh, of, of her or his life. Uh, 
in any case, I'm going to stop there by just having thrown out one or two of these ideas, and we'll come back to them, I hope, later on. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Paul, I wanted to ask one question before we move to Liz, and um, I, I wondered, um, when you write a poem, do you start with an image and an idea, or as you were describing, do you think there's a feeling state, and out of the feeling state, something coalesces in terms of words? You know, I think that often um, uh, it, it does come down to a feeling, a sense, a vague hunch that if one were to put down these elements, something interesting might happen. But Frost's description there of not knowing what he's doing, which of course uh, we've heard from many, many other sources, Keats most memorably in his description of negative capability, um, they must not know what is going on frankly. They must not know what the poem is about for the simple reason that if they know, the rest of us probably know too. And we need to be brought to a place where none of us expected to be. So ignorance is the, um, the required state. And uh, of course ignorance is something that we find for some reason, uh, not to be greatly cherished in, in our society, uh, though I'm sure there's plenty of it around if we went looking for it. And I, I must say, I take uh, my, my students at, uh, at Princeton are often taken aback when having uh, arrived in this uh, institution, the first thing that many of us, and certainly I try to do with them, is to suggest that only when they give themselves over to a very particular kind of humility, ignorance before the possibility of what might happen to them, if they give themselves over to their on or subconscious, out of which uh, that poem, if there's anything in there at all, only then uh, will, will, it, will it emerge. Okay, thank you. And now I'd like to hear from Liz. Um, okay, um, I'm going to come at this from a completely opposite um, situation, which I don't think is um, in any way a disagreement. It's just a different way of talking. And um, I believe in the arts, uh, music, theater, uh, poetry, as a true healing and uh, enlightening form, if it is good. I don't uh, take well to these forms being used with bad language and uh, phony ethnic um, wands and all that stuff. So, um, but I, I, uh, my mother, uh, as I've written about, committed suicide when I was 23. And my brother was a schizophrenic who starved himself when he was 46 to death. And I grew up with a fluent in schizophrenic ease because I didn't know he was schizophrenic. And anybody, I could be walking down the street and schizophrenics know that I'm, you know, they just walk up to me and I go, hi, you know. And, and um, I've uh, witnessed so much trauma and so much uh, mood. I mean, uh, I myself uh, was diagnosed as bipolar, but I've been for 20 years now completely okay and am not ashamed of, you know, uh, the medication or whatever you have to do, the sleep and all that stuff. I come to the arts with a mission on some level, but I'm always very careful to say, it's got to be good. And so um, given all of this, I wrote a show with runaways, and I took runaways off the street, and I gave them poetry, and I gave them all kinds of things to bring them up. And um, since then, I have done many, many different kinds of uh, artistic endeavors that take on these very dark, 
sides of human nature and in some way uh, use them as a way to show people how to survive. And um, one of the things that uh, has happened because of that is that I was hired by NYU. There were four suicides uh, six years ago at NYU and they didn't know what to do. They, they were afraid of a contagion. And um, so uh, they called upon me to make a show called The Reality Show, which would help freshmen um, look at what they're up against. Um, alienation, sexually transmitted infections, um, sex before you're ready, loneliness, uh, depression, um, anything that you can imagine when you first, in New York, right? <laughs> You come from the Midwest, right? And again, they called upon me and they said, would you make a show with these students, with songs, poetry, whatever? And I said, there's one criteria. It has to be good. It has to be a show because the arts have to be really good. Now, I'm not putting down Sylvia Plath, right? In fact, I set the entire Book of Ariel to music, but I was 21 when I did it, and I wore a lot of black, you know, and I walked around, and I, and I did that, right? I also set Ted Hughes' Crow to music, and that's how I learned about poetry, by setting it to music. So it's not that I'm saying you can't go to those dark places and you can't, you know, but there are other ways to deal with the traumas that human beings who are either economically crippled or emotionally damaged, latchkey kids, abused uh, women, um, whenever I deal with these things, as in the NYU show, I try to come at them with what I call through the back door, which is intensifying what the experience is, but doing it in another way. And in doing that, what I try to do is I try to wake up the unconscious of the audience and, and say to them, you know, these people are in trouble, maybe you're in trouble, but there's a wonderful thing called the arts, which can help free you because you can look at things in a different way. Um, humor, for me, is very important. So I'm going to start out. Um, I'm not going to do the, the stuff that I do with the kids, because I don't want to say fuck 27 times like we do in our show. So I'm going to do something a little bit more um, recent. But you have to understand that I believe that the arts, as, as beautiful as Robert Frost, I went to Bennington and I used to go and visit him, and um, it's Robert Frost and it's a kid from a blood gang who after five weeks of working with me finally writes an astounding paragraph about what it took to um, do his initiation and how he was forced to cut another kid across the face. And he'd never done it before, he'd never said it. And it's good writing. And when he performs it for other people, they're like, that. And not just because, but, and also the, the performance of it. But let me take you into the more humorous land of, I'll show you some of the th subjects that are treated in these two poems I'm going to read to you are more adult, perhaps, problems, but they're contemporary, um, psychological, sociological um, uh, problems which go with kids and adults. And um, so I just want to show you, in a way, kind of like what my attitude is. Um, um, this is called contest, okay? Um, it is a rowing contest, 
and I don't know who's going to win. Stroke, you motherfuckers. Oh, I lied. <laughs> There's a mother. In one shell, the anorexics. In another, the bulimics. On the right, the bipolars. On the left, the unidepressives. Stroke, you motherfuckers. They race towards the stone bridge with the low arches. They're all Ivy Leaguers. The prize, books to be published about conquering their conditions. But not if your madness can't speed the oars. The water is murky brown, ugly and intentionally muddied up for the race. Not deep enough so the oars scrape. Perfect conditions for the wrist and arm cutters. Shallow enough to break bones for the Munchausens. Lots of broken glass from the young alcoholics who smashed bottles the night before and therefore were disqualified, thus meeting their goal. What fun, what fun, what fun to be menti mentally, emotionally undone. Row, you motherfuckers. The anorexics and bulimics are already publishing. Pull, you moody bastards. Don't let those bony shoulders cross the line. It's tight to the finish. The bipolars zoom ahead at a mystifying speed. Manic, manic, manic. And then inexplicably, they row backwards. <laughs> Depression, just exactly as it should be. What professionals, the announcers announce. The referee has the gun, the checkered flag, in his tight striped shirt and two small baseball cap. He is laughing. Obesity disqualified him when his kayak kept sinking. Whichever crew wins, the referee shoots. Whichever crew loses, shoots themselves. What fun. It's done. College shootings high on the charts. Bestseller lists of movies of the week in the making. Next week, gymnastics. Who will be the most overtrained, underfed, abused, overworked, and underaged? The champions. To the winners, a television series. Ten years in the making. So you see, this is the this is what I try to work on with my actors and my kids and in my shows. Theater people always drink a lot of water. <laughs> I don't know what it is. We walk around with bottles of water and we drink it. Um, <laughs> the idea of mood, the idea of the tragedy, it's much more, I mean, I don't claim to be anywhere near the Greeks, although I have done Medea, Electra, the Trojan women, I've scored them in, in ancient Greek and Latin, and I've done Agamemnon, and I did Heracles in Greece, and I know that the tragedies are very, very strong and are at the root of even what people feel when they are in psychotic or clinical depressions. And I know that the arts are deeper than what I'm reading to you right now. I'm trying to cover a, a couple of things. The, the, the Greek tragedies and how they uh, foresaw our um, culture and where we would go emotionally. And then I'm trying to show you how I try to take away that kind of uh, narcissism when I am working with people and when I am working on uh, contemporary political or emotional issues and how I try to take away that romance with death and that romance with suicide because it does nobody any good and certainly with younger performers it really is dangerous. So um, it's a double thing. I understand the depth of the uh, sorrow, the grief, the rage that you kept using. Rage, that's the word. I understand how that can, you know, I've had kids pull knives on me. I've had older actresses throw chairs at me, right? And yet I know that there is great beauty that can come out of these kinds of 
situations, and that is through the arts, poetry, music. I had a group of four, I, I did a piece called Jerusalem. Tell me if I'm talking too long, okay? Okay, I did a piece called Jerusalem, which was about the Mideast, and I found 14 different languages. I had a Ford Foundation grant, and I went all around New York and its boroughs, and I found all the people that exist in the old city of Jerusalem. And they hated each other. I had them sitting in a circle, and they hated each other until they began to sing. And I had them sing their religious songs because they were all religious people. I had an Ethiopian priest. I had a Russian Orthodox priest. I had a cantor. I had a rabbi. I had, you name it, I had it. It was in this room. And they began to sing. And when they sang, and I asked them first to sing lullabies. And they had gorgeous voices. And as they began to sing, something really did change. Now that may sound very sentimental, but it was it. They really saw that their modalities, their phrasing, right, their, that there was, a, there was something that went through. And they came together and they created this piece with me about Jeremiah going to the people in Jerusalem and saying, stop fighting or you're going to burn your city. And we did that and we did it in the languages, and they didn't listen, and so we used the book of Revelations and uh, a quotation from the Torah and exploded with voice at the end. So there are pieces that I've done that have dealt with culture's moods. So, okay, then um, I just want to read one more humorous thing just to really put us all in the middle of chaos, because I'm talking about so many different things. But that's me. I, 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 that's my life. And then we'll go back. Is this OK? Yes. OK. This is a new poem. And this deals with women, which I believe is something I also, I've done Bible women. I've done women of valor. I believe that um, um, women's liberation is back in the 1400s. I think there's a lot that's gone wrong. Anyway, Massacre at the Spa. I wonder if anyone has ever committed suicide at one of those posh summer camps for adult women who, whether wanting to or not, must concentrate hour after hour on skin tone, smell beneath the fingernails, strength of calves, muscles under the neck, placement of spine, strength of the core, core, core. I mean, what if you're one of those unfortunates who have no core? Colorless, coreless as you are, dragging your coreless self from class to class, being told endlessly to concentrate on your core, even as you unsuccessfully try to stand on one foot. Couldn't a woman go mad comparing flesh against flesh in the heaving steam room, the North in California sauna, the jacuzzi, the jacuzzi where breasts float and look at each other like stupid seals. Hasn't there ever been one suicide by a woman who went into the aerobics room in between step classes and shot up a combination of vitamin and B12 and smack? No one ever snuck in a bottle of J&B to take with a handful of antidepressants in the Native American meditation room? No one has ever left off a cliff during the 6.30 a.m. brisk mountain walk for beginners and intermediates, put a plastic bag over her own head and slashed her wrists in the, her wrists in the mud pool. I can't believe this isn't so. What with the monotony, the striving, the control of daylight, the flatness of Sweden, the walls of unforgiving mirrors, the company of, of secretly depressed women who have come to rearrange the flesh around those flawed genetics and just can't get the leg to lift eight times like a scissors. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I must research this. Remind me after I have my massage with hot rocks. 
I mean, why hasn't anyone taken these smooth stones, which are heated in a clay oven, and pummeled the bored, dyed, blonde-haired masseuse in her off-white uniform to death? Or better yet, why has no one brought an AK-47 or Uzi into the landscaped mini-village of these lands of stucco and take out every nutritionist, aura counselor, drummer, flower therapist, past life expert, manicurist of inner visual journey guide, and visual diet specialist, leaving well-toned bodies in piles by the bright exercise balls and elastic straps, blood in puddles by the learn how to cook your own meal mini kitchen, corpses on the outdoor yoga beach. I wonder why no one has gone mad from health, mad from so much health, violent from so much gentle attention, the long knowing stares, the quick smiles. Why has there been no mass murder by a woman who came to lose eight pounds and only could make it four? Be careful, for the time will come and the outcome will be messy and the white doves in the quiet room will fly off laughing with blood on their wings and screams will gag out from the slit throat of the morning Hatha yoga chanting teacher. Stay away. There will be one hamburger made out of zucchini, too many. One gentle squat holding a powder blue three-hand, three-weight hand, too much. The time is coming. Revelations is nothing. It is the spa brochure and extras that know the future of the end of the beginning, of time spent or time ignored, and they are lost. So thank you, Liz. And I was going to ask you a question, but I, I think you've Go answered it. <laughs> but I would like to quote you from a 2005 interview. Yeah. Um, and I think that it, it sums up what you've just been discussing. And that in that interview, you said you could heal people through theater, not by making everything all right. And I assume you mean you don't cure cancer, you don't give them a roof over their head, you may not even be able to give them groceries. I do give them roofs over their heads you and do? I help them buy groceries. Okay. <laughs> but but you make them feel alive again through theater, not just through the groceries. And you show them that there's a point to life. And I, I think that's what you're talking about. Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I was going to ask you both something other than what I'm about to ask, but I fear that listening to both of you, I should put myself out of business, or it could be I could put the two of you out of business. And so this is the question. If Robert Frost, or if one of your runaway actors had talked to me about their troubles and understood their mood and their thoughts and images and feelings, would their endorphins have gone up and they'd be okay? When, when you say I talk to you, do you mean as, as a, a psychiatrist? As a psychiatrist. Right, and so <laughs> then no art. They don't need to do an art. They can feel better. Well, I do think that uh, there is a psychiatric aspect to art in the sense of one, one is making self, sense of oneself and one's society. And I think that would be a way of describing what's happening to the uh, young people, that are older people in some cases, that Liz is working with. And I'm, I don't know, for example, if it's uh, that they are being given solace or sucker in any of the conventional ways that we think of it. Uh, because we do seem to have come to a point uh, where in the popular imagination, uh, that certainly is something that, that art could or should be doing. All else has failed. Saving our circumstances here, organized religion has failed. So art must somehow come in to save the day. And while I think it does in some sense come in to uh, help us make sense of things, perhaps help us to, to live our lives, um, uh, it's not necessarily through offering um, solace or succor. It may be forcing the young man that you describe to come to terms with his with what he did in his gang initiation. And it's as much 
uh, surely uh, the fact that he's able to um, meet that aspect of himself as it is that he meets it uh, in in what you're describing as uh, good good language. I mean, obviously, one wants it's preferable, I suppose, that there's a, a some sense of um, artistry about it. But I think it's the sense that he has. Um, Met with himself, that uh, is 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 uh, going perhaps to help him, rather than art being placed as a ban on the on the ills of society. Uh, I mean, in terms of when you ask your question about. Healthcare, for example, um, you know, poetry. We would love to think will have many, have much impact on the world, but frankly, um, the President Obama's health plan is going to have more impact in a, for more people than uh, than poetry will. I, I I I believe that to be the case. Poetry will help in in many other ways, uh, but it's. Uh, it should not necessarily be called upon to solve all society's ills. Um, not society's ills, maybe, but do you think people will feel better just because they're involved in art? Uh, I'm not quite sure why we think that people feeling better is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. I, re I really, I'm not sure about that. One of m my sense is that art, and I think this is probably actually what I say, I don't think Liz and I are disagreeing uh, on this, I suspect we're not, uh, is that um, they're, 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 they're not really, um, um, they're, they're not really um, attempting to um, find solace. I believe they're not. Mm -hmm. um, we may disagree as artists, you and I, what is a good poem or what is a good monologue. But what I find is he read that to me and it was extraordinary. And I looked at him and I said, that is really very good. It is really good, but it's a little too long. Could you cut it? <laughs> and he just lit up because he was working. And he was working as an artist. And he, he wasn't just being treated like a psychiatric patient. Right. And, and I believed in him, by the way. Part of, part of it is not being phony. I really believed in that, in that speech. And I, don't, um, uh, and I don't make it up. It was too long. And he fixed it. And it was even more effective. And I think that when people can be uh, either confronted with truly good art, and this is where we may disagree what is truly good art, but that's everybody in the world, you know, but when he is, when he is uh, touched by his own uh, good writing, something happens inside that you can't describe. It's, I mean, it's what I went to in my life to save myself. I picked up the guitar at the age of 10 and I spent two weeks just until my fingers bled. I know that's so dramatic, but it's true. It, because I had to get rid of what was going on in my family. And but I wanted to do it well. And I think that that feeling of being able to be an artist is uh, in some ways a, a gift that is beyond anything that else that I can imagine. But second to that is to be able to experience an artist like that and to have him share his freedom, his discovery, his coming to terms with himself, with you in the room as a witness to his discovery. So the audience wins too. It works both ways. 
I don't think psychiatry is good. I think it comes later. Okay. So I need to remind people that um, you're at the Cambridge Forum and we're discussing mood and muse with uh, Liz Suedos and Paul Muldoon. Um, I told Liz a story and I sent Paul an email about it. Lenore Ter is a psychiatrist who writes about trauma. Trauma is attached to mood and to intensity of feeling and to actually being shattered by feelings. And what she writes about is artists who she feels continually try to get over what's happened to them as a life experience through their art. One example that she gives is Magritte, whose mother committed suicide. And when Magritte's mother was found and Magritte saw his mother, her dead body, her face was obscured by her clothing. And of course, if you look at his artwork, many of his paintings have no head, no face. There may be an apple instead of a face. Um, on a lighter note, she describes uh, Hitchcock, and Alfred Hitchcock's father must have been not a very nice guy. He sent his little six-year-old Alfred to the magistrate with a sealed envelope, and inside the envelope it said, my little boy has been naughty, put him in jail for a few minutes, which the magistrate did, and Hitchcock, being six years old, didn't know how long this period of time would last. And My new book of poetry, not to push it, is about Houdini, who endlessly was trying to escape death, endlessly was daring the elements of the world to kill him. And he always won until he didn't. And um, he's another example. And he had a father who was a rabbi, who was a bitter failure of a man. And he had to beat his father at everything again and again and again, and more tricks and harder tricks. Well, with Hitchcock, what she points out, which is connected to this, is that in many of his movies, there's false accusation. And that she doesn't say that trauma makes creativity. She says if you're creative, you can make use of trauma. And she also says you don't necessarily feel better or work it out. And in fact, it may be apocryphal, but apparently Hitchcock's gravestone says, here lies a naughty little boy. And so he, to the end, he didn't work it out. Stephen King is another example where he, at age four, played on a train track with a pal. The train came, he jumped off and he saw his friend dismembered oh. and then again of course in his adult writing there are many dismembered characters so um, I was going to ask and I think you you mentioned to me that you thought Houdini not only as Houdini and his art but that, that he captured you and you wrote about him had to do with your trauma as well. Yeah, trying to escape again and again and again from terrible situations. And um, the, uh, there's another level of it, which is that the need to recreate the terrible situations in other ways so that you symbolically s keep escaping. Uh, that's an artistic thing that happens too. Um, you can, or, or a life thing, you can neurotically or artistically, there's sometimes the same thing. You can sort of create the situations that were traumatic for you so that you can win again and again and again because you don't really ever believe. I don't think Houdini ever believed that he escaped. Okay. So I did want to, oh, do you want to say? Well, I was just going to say, that, I mean, there are other aspects of, of trauma that um, I, I find uh, more and more engaging. And one of them is the sense of a national trauma, in, insofar as one might discuss such a thing. Um, you know, one uh, doesn't want to uh, start trying to claim that Ireland, for example, is the most put-upon nation in the world. It's, we certainly wouldn't want to be claiming that. However, I think there are aspects of the Irish experience that, one of them being the great famine of the 1840s, which at some level uh, still hasn't quite been 
um, met by the Irish people. And there's a lot of extraordinary work been done on this now. And there's a school of thought, for example, uh, whereby James Joyce's story, The Dead, which, if you recall, ends with this image of the uh, the shades of the dead uh, all all over Ireland, uh, looming in the darkness. Um, uh, and at the centre of this story is a feast. And at some level, it's almost as if it's either a feast or a famine. And indeed, it's very hard to find a work of Irish literature in the second half of the 19th century that really begins to come to terms with it. So, I mean, I think there's, uh, in ter uh, there, there is a delayed um, coming to terms if indeed we ever do come to terms with some of these issues, and I'm sure that's true not only for nations but for, uh, for individuals. And at some level, whether or not we're involved in um, psychiatry or, or poetry, Eat or the extent to which we are, have been oppressed in our childhoods. We are all, I'd like to suggest, attempting to make sense. Uh, if we're lucky, uh, if we have the, the leisure to do it, to try to make sense of what happened to each of us when we were one or two or three or four. Can you talk about music? I could try to, a little bit. Um, you know, well, one thing I would, in, in that respect, um, when I was a kid, um, I remember being lifted bodily by a music teacher. He picked me up by the scruff of the neck and the seat of the pants and threw me out of the classroom, <laughs> saying, that I must never go back in there again. I'm not quite sure what I was doing. I've sort of drawn a veil over that. But I think basically I was, I was not able to sing. And he insisted to me that I could not sing, should not sing, knew nothing about music. And I wonder if it at some level, I mean, he happens to be right, actually. But I wonder, I wonder if at some level my own interest in song, maybe this is psychology 10, well, it's not even 101, it's more like 50 and a half. Um, uh, you know, my own engagement with these, these matters has to do with uh, at some level, um, at some level saying, you know, actually I can do this, I believe I can, and you were wrong to do that to me. It wasn't right to say that to a child, you know? And uh, I mean, of course, I, I also happen to believe that people who attempt to write for the most part uh, certainly it's true of my own case, do so not because they're good at it, but almost precisely because they're bad at it. Uh, that they, they, they take, I certainly do, take so long to write a sentence in an email or otherwise. <laughs> you know, I can't write, well, I will see you at 3.30. I have to think about the order of every word. It's the curse of living as someone who doesn't expect to write anything that's going to go over the page for the most part, and is willing, uh, has become willing because at some level it's, it's a necessity to spend so long writing that sentence and trying to get it right. Yeah. Which is that idea that you referred to earlier on about your, your, your student uh, who'd been in the gang. And I think what's great about that story is that it isn't, the realization that occurs to me that he might have been making was that you were thinking of him as an artist. You were meeting him on those terms. Right. Yeah, it's not the subject matter necessarily, which just happens to be, in some sense, graphic. But I mean, one could find any number of graphic um, uh, items of subject matter. Right. So it's really, 
as you say, more about how it's done. Uh, one of the things about him, just very briefly, was mm. that he wouldn't make eye contact for the first six weeks that he was in. How he got there is a, is a long story. I let people kind of bring their friends when I'm making groups, and he wouldn't make co eye contact with me for, he came, but he wouldn't make eye contact, and then one day, and, I, and, ev he, and every time he would look at me, I wouldn't make eye contact with him. So he, I would look at him and he'd look away and then he'd look at me and I'd look away and then one day we looked at each other and that's when it really, you know, it really started to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to ask one question that kind of ties this together and then we should open it to the audience. But you're both educators as well since you work in multiple genres, music and writing and you educate. And I'll tell you a brief story. My son, when he was in fourth grade, wrote an, art, an essay. He was, they asked them to write fiction. He wrote a story about a dinosaur that ate Los Angeles. It was so well constructed that the teacher said, you must read this to the class, which he did. And then my husband and I were called in and we were told our son could never write about violence again. That was it. Oh dear. And so, well, I tried to convince the teacher Los Angeles was still in existence and <laughs> dinosaurs were not. However, she didn't buy that. So, you know, anyway, what I was curious about from both of you is do you believe the current education system kills creativity? And if so, what do the two of you do to counteract that? Well, uh, you know, I, I do believe that uh, children are more often than not natural musicians, natural poets, natural playwrights. Uh, it sounds a little um, wordsworthy and the child is father to the man. But I really believe that uh, an eight or nine year old child in the area that I know a little bit about, not much, but something about, which is poetry. The greatest poets, I think, are often eight or nine years of age. And again, it's because they don't know what they're doing. Right. A large part of it has to do with that. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we, we've come to a point where we need to know what we're doing, but combine it with that sense of not knowing. All sorts of things happen, of course, uh, by the time a child is uh, 13 or 14. And if one asks a 13 or 14 year old in this country to write a poem, she will write a ninth uh, rate version of a Dr. Seuss poem. So what has happened in there? I mean, this is just a fact of life. What has happened? Dr. Seuss is a great poet, I think, but wh how come everyone suddenly is writing these these half half baked examples of Dr. Seuss? Um, there may be a number of things come, going on, puberty's kicking in, self-consciousness, all the rest of it. But I think for the most part, poetry is not uh, particularly well taught in our secondary schools, if indeed it's taught at all. Um, if it's taught, it's at the very end of the year. It's taught by people who are afraid of it themselves, who had a bad experience of it themselves for the most part. And, on f and I believe, actually, unfortunately, unfortunately, one of the things that our children are taught is poetry for young people, <laughs> which I'm sure there are wonderful, wonderful uh, examples of it. But you know, we don't. T we tend not to teach them astrophysics for young people, uh, or music for young people, <laughs> or uh, chemistry for young people. Though, of course, you know, we can imagine. You know, the the min the, the the starter Bunsen burner. But you know, uh, that that I think is is a real problem, and there's absolutely no reason why our uh, young people shouldn't be reading Frost and Yeats and uh, Elizabeth Bishop and Marion Moore and Emily Dickinson and all the rest of them. And indeed, uh, reading, uh, if we were lucky enough to get our hands on it, what your student came up with. I think in this country, we have our children playing cabbages and carrots and talking about nutrition or we have uh, them doing arsenic and old lace where like why is a 12 year old playing, you know, there's absolutely no repertory, no uh, uh, plays, nothing that they're doing that has been written 
even I beg my friends who are really good writers to write plays for kids who are, you know, 10 to 15. Just please, David Mamet. Well, uh, not David Mamet, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, 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 that would be hard. But, you know, please, David, Ra well, I don't know, please, please someone, you know, uh, a playwright. Wally Shawn could do it. He could write a great, wonderful piece for kids. I mean, why is the children's theater so demeaning? They, I mean, they do Hello, Dolly, you know? I mean, Hello, Dolly is bad enough for grown-ups. <laughs> you know, it's, it's horrendous. The state of the theater, the state of the theater for young people is one of the worst things um, in the arts in this country. And uh, it's really one of the reasons why I set out the way I did was because I just couldn't believe it, you know. And um, there are a group of us who try to make stuff with kids and make it better. But I, I believe really strongly that it's in this area that, uh, that you know, any hope of having a vibrant uh, cultural life in this country resides. Um, you know, they... they if our secondary um, level students, you know, have not a better sense of what's available in all of these art forms, it's very hard to see uh, what they might be doing at the third level. I mean, it seems in many cases at the secondary level they're they're doing the work that should have been done at the primary level, the, gr the first, the grade level, grade school level. And, and so on and so forth. And uh, one hates to sound like an old fogey, but uh, um, you know, so much is being lost in this respect. So I think we um, opened many doors to many topics, but we do need to let the audience ask questions. If you could line up and um, please ask questions. Otherwise, I have plenty more. <laughs> Well, I, I want to uh, deliver some good news, uh, which is that there actually are uh, teachers in the secondary level who are doing magnificent things uh, around poetry with, uh, with, with young people, treating them uh, as, as who they are, taking their material seriously. Uh, as Liz knows, I'm, I happen to be her publisher, and. Uh, our magazine, Hanging Loose, which has been going for 43 years now, has a special section devoted to high school poetry and has done so for the last 43 years. And the poems that are produced, we don't produce them, we're just the editors. And they, they, they come to us by poets who teach in high schools, uh, take their, uh, their students seriously, and, and teach them not children's literature, but, but real poetry and the students respond and produce remarkable, remarkable work. Uh, we're just publishing our fourth anthology of the best high school writing uh, and ask some of the teachers to actually contribute, what, you know, how, how do they do this? How do they, why are they different from all those other high school teachers that are producing all this schlock and getting them to look at the rhyme schemes and, uh, and Scansion rather than talking about, you know, what do you have to say? What is, you know, what is your, your angry mood that's going to be the inspiration that makes you explore it and, and, and not know what, where's, where you're going to end up with that poem so that it becomes the real, the real thing. And sometimes these kids have been selected for the best American poetry anthology as high school kids. I mean, they're that good. Well, indeed, they're, um, as I suggested earlier on, um, they're often much better than the rest of us. Yeah. Um, and I don't doubt for a minute that there, there are m many uh, high school teachers who do a wonderful job. Of course there are. But uh, uh, I think th uh, my sense is that the norm is still um, a little weak in that oh, respect. And the way that. poetry is taught... Uh, has to do with uh, alliteration and uh, smooth and rough sounds and uh, in other words it, if chemistry were taught at that level it would be along the lines of 
here's the Bunsen. Don't you like it? Uh, so we would not have that in, in, that, uh, in that vein. So still a lot to be done. I agree. I also want to say on that level, there's wonderful people who are working with children in theater, but not nearly enough. Um, question, is, is there a thinking about poetry, art in general, and the whole uh, related but very different idea of self-expression? Um, there's a, it, as some of you know, Leslie University has a, has a course, a graduate course in uh, expressive therapy. Art, creation, expression, it's all kind of in there together, which, which leads me to the question, um, is, there a, is there a correlation between, taking poetry as an example, is there a correlation between the value of a poem for the person who's written it and the quality of the poem for the person reading it? Is, is there a correlation there? Correlation between the what? Between the value of a poem. In other words, can somebody write a poem which does them a lot of good, but it's a lousy poem? That's what I mean. <laughs> no. Thank you. I, I, I really don't believe. I think that my job, if I was would be to work and work and work and make it a good poem, and then that person would be feeling better. I think they know, I, I mean, I believe in kids, you know, like, like nothing else. And I think they know when they're doing good stuff and they know when they're not. So, you're, so your editing is, is, is aiding both the writer and the reader? I think so. I think so too, actually. Frost, whom I mentioned earlier on, has a great line about this. He says, no tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. Mm -hmm. And at some level, if the person uh, through whom the poem is being written, let's stick, or the play, the play is being written, uh, doesn't have some sense of revelation, doesn't actually experience some shift in herself, no one else will. But and in that respect, go ahead. I'm sorry, but then, but can you experience that sense of shift and of revelation and still have the poem come out not so good? Uh, you know, I doubt it. Okay. I doubt it. Good, you know, there is no gold standard for good. The good is determined by each piece itself, the, s the terms that it sets up. And so if it's going to work, uh, it, it, it's either going to work or it's not for the person who wrote it. And if it's not going to work for her or him, it's certainly not going to work for anyone else re coming down the road to it. In terms of self-expression, you know, I was a child, uh, I was born in 1951, so in, even in Ireland, the 60s sort of happened. They didn't arrive until a bit later, or maybe even into the 70s in some cases. But I was always amused by the notion of self-expression, and I'm not entirely sure if I understand it. I mean, I'm not sure of what self-expression would look like. Look like a bad poem. Well, you know, um, the, the, the last thing one would be expressing at some level is oneself, because the self, I think, needs to be left out of the equation. You know, you know, it's, I'm sorry. But I was just going yeah, to say, go but, ahead, necessary list, but necessarily, willy-nilly, the self does get expressed. Yeah. Because, I mean, a profound amount of uh, DNA of, of the personality through whom the piece was written, performed, whatever, is left at the scene of the crime, as it were. But the impulse, but that happens by the way, by the way, I think it's problematic if the impulse is to express the self. I, I think there's also a, an issue here of orchestration, because we're both musicians, and um, I'll give an example. I had a kid who could not learn one piece of choreography. First of all, he was machismo, 
and he was not about to dance. And then when he tried, he couldn't put his feet together, and he was getting more and more miserable. And I sat and I looked at him, and um, I thought about it, and I thought, no, this guy, he's not a dancer. You know, what am I doing to this poor kid? You know, so I walked up to him and I said, what's your favorite sport? And he said, I play football. I said, okay, so put together some football moves for me. You know, like get a football and make a football dance. He said, what's a football dance? I said, I don't know, I've never seen one. <laughs> you know, but you do it, go ahead. And then you teach it to the rest of the group. So he put together the moves, he looked great. He was totally confident, it was good. And when he taught it to the kids, it really rocked. Now there were a few kids, of course, who couldn't do the football moves. <laughs> so then I had to deal with that. But you know, it's sort of orchestration. It's like, it's like I, I'm talking about self-expression. The true self-expression is to understand the instrument and start with what the instrument can really do. And then if it can stretch, great. But if you don't get the instrument doing the right thing, it's not going to stretch. I want to come back to something you asked, you talked about earlier, Paul, and you said that in some ways the act of writing, which takes you out of time, is like a drug. It's like a? It's like a drug. Mm -hmm. And it's something that a writer needs to come back to again and again and again. Um, I wanted to ask Liz whether, how she reacted to that statement. And then I wanted to ask you both how you would relate that sense of, of what writing does to the writer to the traditional images we've been given of the muse and what, what role does the muse play in that drug scenario? Um, just to answer your question briefly, um, I'm out in the field so much that it's the only place where I can find solace and it's the place that I come home to and either sitting at the piano and writing a piece of music of my own or writing a poem is the place where I find myself again. And it stores me up and uh, helps me live um, and go out there again. It's, um, it's absolutely a drug. It's a good drug, it's the only drug. I'm sure that uh, I have a sense anyway I'm not sure about anything. Oh, actually, I am sure that one of the reasons why I come, come back to that desk is in the hope that something akin to that particular buzz, um, that physical um, resonance that uh, has occurred from time to time in the past, might happen again. You know that Asap Mandelstam used to hum his poems? He'd start humming and humming and humming and he'd lie on his couch and he'd hum until the words came. Well, there are many songwriters, I think, who do, who do uh, something along those lines, these the lyrics that yeah. are um, you know, mock, mock lyrics. Uh, I'm sure Wordsworth, whom we mentioned earlier on, did a bit of humming and hawing as he walked up and down at the bottom of the garden. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I'm sure that uh, out, of, out of the occasional hum, um, a hymn might emerge, <laughs> you know? Um, who knows? But, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of work still to be done on this. I mean, there's already some work obviously been done on the, uh, how the brain is functioning during various um, acts of um, art making and taking, i.e. Uh, there being pretty much the same thing. I think reading and writing are really part of the same activity, to go back to what we were saying earlier on. So to scan 
we have only a, a dim view, I think, of what we're looking at now in terms of those elect little electrical um, uh, peaks uh, when we uh, see um, an, an image being registered in a reader or certainly a me apparently a metaphor being made. I think I'm right in saying that that impulse to make those connections is, if you think about it, very basic to how the brain itself is functioning in terms of these little um, neurons firing. I talk as if I know what I'm saying, I really don't. <laughs> but anyway, um, but you know, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure that there is a physical, um, there's a sense of well being, which maybe, maybe is actually contradictory to what I was saying earlier on in terms of succor mm -hmm. uh, and solace. And maybe I'm wrong to so uh, readily sort of rule it out. Because that may be a version of it, actually. That sense of well-being that we get, well, it's from, from so many activities, activity being one of them. Um, but certainly, uh, for many of us who are not running uh, five miles a day, uh, the poem or the possibility that that buzz might, might come back to us. Unfortunately, the buzz is related not necessarily to a good poem. It could be related to oh anything yeah. at all. <laughs> oh, yeah. I sweat when I write music. It doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> sweat when it's bad, sweat when it's good. Just sweat. I'm a painter by profession, and a lot of what you say I resonate with in my own studio. There are many drawings that I make that just don't make it. There's a lot of sweating, there's a lot of accidents that I learn from. It's a very difficult process. I guess the question is the exhibits of the work. Someone told me that people no longer spend more than six seconds in a, at a, looking at a work of art. And uh, I was at a museum a few weeks ago, the <coughs> Museum. And I actually looked around and sort of timed people, and they did move very quickly past uh, a work of art that maybe took an enormous amount of time and, and thought um, and effort to make. So I, and I also noticed in my own field, there's a lot of awful stuff that I can't relate to. So I just wonder about the clutter and uh, the meaninglessness of a lot of stuff out there. I don't know if you can relate to that. In terms of the time, I mean, actually, there a, a lot of work goes into making the poem, and I'm sure the painting, um, have a sense of immediacy. So I'm not too worried about the six-second um, taking in of the poem. I mean, we've become quite sophisticated, I think, in the way we look with the, with the uh, development of... Uh, our grammar of the visual image and the moving image in the 20th century. Can so I? it may be that looking quickly at a painting is, is okay. And I think probably there's actually, there comes a point in, in most art museums where, you know, you look for a while and then actually the eye is just, there's a surfeit and one begins to move quickly through, you know, running past to Leonardo da Vinci and saying, okay, uh, next, please. So it may be a little bit of that also. I, I don't agree with that. Um, uh, Pete Seeger uh, said uh, that there's so much music now, there's so much going on that people don't, can't differentiate anymore. They don't know how to differentiate style or, I mean, it's just noise. It's just going on and on and on. And, and Stravinsky uh, said, that he wished, do you know this? That he wished that everybody had to walk to his concerts so that they had to work so hard to get there that they'd really listen once they got there, you know? And um, I, because I worked, uh, my pro, one of my protege, one of my proteges, that's really arrogant. <laughs> one of my mentors was Peter Brook. And what he taught me was that the audience is the last thing to worry about. 
and how long they listen, how long they look. It, it's the process of making the thing, and it will find its audience as a lover finds another lover. I guess I told Paul that I had read his scholarly book, The End of the Poem, and um, in that book, I realized all the poetry I didn't understand, I would understand better if I understood the life of the poet, the culture the poet grew up in, the context and historical events. And then I read John Tim Payne's It Could Be Verse, <laughs> and what he tries to help a person like me with, with poetry is to just swallow it, swish the sounds around, and enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if either of you felt that that's not the best way to enter poetry, I guess. I mean, uh, essentially, it's sensual. I just felt it, and it, the thump and the rump and the sounds and the feel of it made me feel something. And even though I didn't know about Emily Dickinson and Franklin Stoves or the Northwest Passage and when that was discovered, and that was all referenced in some of Emily Dickinson's poetry, suddenly, because of this other way of looking at poetry, I, I, I got something. Yeah. And that's OK. I think that's great. I think that's great, too. I mean, um, <clears throat> each poem, as I say, demands, it sets up the terms in which it's going to be read. And to, to admire the poem as a, one aspect of most poems is, is the physical aspect. But it is only one aspect. And those are not merely sounds. They tend, not always, but they tend to be associated with meanings. Uh, so the poem, you know, is, is not, in general, uh, merely a concatenation of, of noises. It is moving towards um, meaning something. Okay. Mm. So go ahead. Yeah. First of all, I want to thank you both this uh, wonderful evening. Uh, and thank you for coming up and uh, being a part of it. Uh, my question has to do with when you think the muse for the personal connects to the political. You earlier mentioned Pete Seeger, who of course is a great hero of many of us in the anti-war movement here in New England. Uh, many other people found uh, great inspiration in him as a leader. Uh, he uh, found within his own uh, uh, style of presentation a political way to talk to a generation that really led. And recently I saw in the uh, Joan Baez documentary on PBS, another woman who had a tremendous impact upon uh, those of us who were in involved with the anti-war movement here in New England. And I'm interested in knowing where it, the personal becomes political in a good way, meaning you shouldn't be political to start with. You have to be personal to come out with an authentic expression. Uh, but if you could uh, spend some time talking about that, I, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I think the personal and the political are connected all the time. Um, and uh, the intensity with which they're connected, though, I think varies, varies from time to time. And, uh, you know, if one happens to be an artist who holds the right view, it's all very fine and well to express it. Um, and... Uh, but if not, it's perhaps inappropriate to express it. Uh, I mean, we tend, uh, we've, we've got to have the right views before we express them. And uh, so that's, that's the point at which it becomes uh, problematic and where it becomes, prop, you know, where various types of propaganda, um, in which I'm sure some artists genuinely believe, uh, though we would like to think that everyone believes in the right things, uh, that's the point where we even have a con where I even use a few sentences like that. That's where difficulties arise. Um, <clears throat> I personally see it as my job. I mean, I, I think it's one with what I do and who I am. And uh, uh, 
sometimes people who disagree with me write amazing things, and I can accept that, but I feel that my, my work is meant to, to do both, to, to wake up some of those sleeping um, emotions about the world. I don't want to be corny, but, um, or, or, you know, to, to wake up the, the, the wish to care again, you know, to, to want to do something again, um, especially in my, my work with uh, kids, but also in everything else I do. It's, it's, I, it's absolutely my job. So we do have to close up in a moment. I just wanted to ask one last thing of both of you. Since you write children's books and you wrote, I think, several poems about your wife's pregnancy and the baby being born. I did. Uh, yes. you, oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, you remember? I did, I did, I did. <laughs> I was just wondering, I guess, see, from the psychiatric standpoint, that would have indicated to me your moods were good or happy ones or joyful or in the range of joy as opposed to um, despair or low? Well, actually, you know, that's an aspect of this that we haven't really touched on too much. The joy, there are certainly, there, are poem, there is a poem uh, in which I am attempting, I suppose, or it is attempting to express something of the joy of um, the world in which we live. Uh, and into, into which this child is coming. But uh, I think the other side of it is that really uh, joy is tends, tends to make news less frequently than its opposite. And I think we are, we are naturally disposed to the opposite of joy. And when Sally comes down the corridor and says, you won't believe I've just met this most wonderful guy. You wouldn't, he's just adorable. You think, okay. But if Sally comes down the corridor and says, you wouldn't believe what that horrible person has done to me. He's left me. Then you think, okay, I'm interested. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just part of how we are. We are immediately more interested in that, on f for better or worse, than we are in Sally's good news. So anyway, uh, we want to be able to explore both and to offer both, since they are, of course, um, on offer here for us. Would you like to comment? Uh, there's a word that we haven't used once tonight. and. Um, it's really icky, but I love uh, through writing children's books. I, I, I love them through what I write, all their mushy sounds and their weird things that they say and the wonderful ways that they topple over and you know the, the, all the things that I love about children go into, go into my... Uh, my books, and um, it's a, it's a, it's just a love of the creature. I mean, children are creatures. And they're great, you know. They're great creatures. So that's what I try to do. Okay. And if I find I'm, you know, not loving a, a thing that I'm doing, um, I usually throw it out. Not with the adult stuff, but with the kids stuff. All right. So unfortunately, I, unless there's a last moment question that anybody feels urgently they need to ask, um, I do need to say thank you, Paul Muldoon. Thank you, Liz Suedos. And um, you've been at the forum. And we thank you for coming. <laughs>